Just say ready. All right, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, John Duke Anthony. I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations, established in 1983 as a 501c3 non-governmental organization, public charity, educational uh, mission is a uh, mission. Uh, today, we have the uh, great privilege and pleasure of having four extraordinary specialists on uh, out of North Africa. This is an area that is a, a little in the media, and when it is, it is not always well informed or extensive or adequate in its uh, reporting. But these four individuals uh, know the area well. And uh, Libya, of course, is uh, much more in the news of late than is uh, Tunisia, Egypt, Morocco, Algeria. Uh, but it's also the most problematic uh, and controversial in the eyes of many, especially South Europe, but also the Arab world and the Arab region, uh, as uh, the Islamic region as well. Uh, Dr. Bill Lawrence is going to uh, moderate and chair this session. Uh, he's a professor of political science and international affairs at American University in Washington, D.C. He's also taught at Georgetown University, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, uh, and George uh, uh, and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy uh, in uh, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, Dr. Lawrence uh, has been a senior diplomat. He's been an analyst. He's been an international programs director. Uh, rarely uh, does a person combine all three of these uh, characteristics, skills, and, and talents. Uh, he uh, has worked and lived in 15 different uh, countries in the Middle East, North Africa region, especially the Arab North Africa region. In uh, the U.S. Embassy in Tripoli, he was involved in negotiating the first major agreement in decades uh, uh, with the Libyan government uh, there. He's taught in Morocco, in uh, Rabat, the capital, in uh, Marrakech, which is in the Berber language, but Marrakesh, uh, known and pronounced to, to most Westerners. Uh, he has received six different senior merit awards from the Department of, of State, uh, as has one of the speakers in today's uh, uh, session. Uh, for some uh, Tom, he was the uh, senior advisor to the U.S. government on uh, science and environmental affairs. He co-chaired the Egypt-U.S. fund and uh, received, as a result of that, two superior awards from the, uh, the government of Egypt. Uh, for the International Crisis Group, probably the single most prominent of all of the international affairs organizations engaged in regular analysis of breaking news and trends and indications uh, throughout the world. He is its uh, uh, out of North Africa uh, director and also uh, the director of its focus and programs on uh, Islam and uh, democracy. Now, if you think that that's not uh, enough to keep anyone busy in a lifetime, uh, ponder the following. Uh, he's been involved in the production of six films having to do with Arab North Africa and 15 musical albums of North African um, music. Without further ado, Dr. William Lawrence of American University School of International Service. Dr. Lawrence. Thank you very much, Duke, for that uh, all too generous introduction. Unfortunately, I'm not one of the panelists uh, today, but I'm going to try to contribute in every way I can to the conversation. Uh, you reminded me when I was introduced once for a ambassador meeting at the European Union, and they mentioned that I had produced the first Arab rap song when I was in the music industry. <laughs> and suddenly, suddenly, uh, the, the audience swelled by four times as many people when they tweeted out that I was there and um, and, 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 and the median age dropped by half. Uh, and I had to announce to the audience that unfortunately I wouldn't be discussing Arab rap <laughs> during the meeting, nor will I today. Uh, but uh, let me say that um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, to all of the uh, participants today 
uh, one of the best panels I've ever had the privilege and pleasure to put together on Libya, and I have done dozens over the years, uh, and we will be getting to them shortly. By way of introduction, I just wanted to thank again Nukusar for this initiative. This is the first in a series of country by country uh, um, webinars, if I can use that term, that we'll be doing on the entire region, starting with North Africa and moving west uh, country by country. So stay tuned in the coming weeks and months for future iterations of this, which we hope will get better and better as we go. Um, the German foreign minister was in Tripoli yesterday and said we're in a moment of deceptive calm. And I think that's a very good description mm. where we are right now. We're, we're waiting for a war to, to heat up that could have epic consequences for the future of Libya, but it's not happening right now. And there are eerie videos coming out of Sirt uh, with, with policemen and and in, in traffic uh, uh, um, intersections, stopping cars, and we're not quite sure why and where the cars need to go because everyone's sort of waiting for the big conflict. In the meantime, we've had more diplomatic activity on Libya than we have since last January during the Berlin conference, including many White House phone calls to heads of state in the region to try to avert this uh, tempest that is supposed to uh, uh, hit Libya uh, anytime soon. Uh, and so it's a really critical moment uh, to take a look at Libya and figure out what's going on. Um, Libya is oft misunderstood, oft understood through Middle Eastern tropes that we use. Um, I have a whole podcast I did for an hour and a half uh, about two years ago on what everyone gets wrong about Libya, which I recommend to you. Um, but, but two elements are that we often hear about chaos in Libya when it's not chaotic most of the time. And we often hear about how it's a society dominated by tribes when it isn't entirely. Although we're gonna hear about how tribes operate and don't operate in Libya during the presentations uh, that you'll hear. Um, Libya has a long, interesting history we won't cover today, but let me just mention in passing uh, that uh, it was long time part of the Ottoman Empire and the Turks are back. And it was for a much shorter period, uh, an Italian colony, and the Italians are deeply involved in what's going on. And there are uh, a number of powers that were there, particularly during and after World War II, that are involved in the conflict. So this, this, this proxy element is not a new thing, and of course won't be our main uh, focus today. We're trying to get beyond the proxies. Uh, but this, 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 these international interests in Libya have a long history, and it's one of the few countries in the world born at the United Nations. Uh, the, the, the sort of mandates for control of Libya that grew out of World War II and the capturing of Libya from the Axis powers led to a UN status, a UN control of Libya, and then the UN birthed Libya. And, and, and so all of us who follow Libya closely were particularly interested in 2011 when it was action at the UN, which was decisive in many ways, in helping Libya turn its page from years of authoritarian rule. Uh, the Libyans have always um, uh, focused on the UN and are now depending on the UN, as we'll get to today, uh, to help find a way out of the current conflict. Um, uh, with the Arab Spring, uh, uh, France, in many ways, had the lead, we'll, um, and we'll, we'll see France as an actor today. Um, but the main game right now in Libya is the second civil war that began in 2014. So the first civil war grew out of the revolution, the Arab Spring Revolution of 2011. Uh, and both camps uh, in the current conflict also grew out of the revolution, although many of the Gaddafi loyalists have sort of joined the Eastern camp, which we'll get into. Um, but in February 2014 on Valentine's Day, uh, General Haftar basically declared war on the government uh, 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 that had sort of stayed beyond its elected mandate. Uh, and, and that war was a war of words at first, but in, in mid-May 2014, he invaded uh, the parliament and parts of Libya in an attempt to take over the country. And that civil war, the second civil war, is the one that we are living through now. Um, the outside powers were there since 2011, uh, 
Qatar was there, UAE was there, Turkey was there, but they have significantly ramped up their involvement in Libya in the last two years uh, uh, as the proxy conflict intensified uh, to some degree on the model of Syria, Yemen, and other conflicts uh, we're seeing in the region. Um, uh, Egypt, Russia, UAE, uh, Sudanese troops funded by UAE, France, and maybe a dozen other countries in various ways, have all been getting more and more involved, uh, either dealing with one side or other than conflict, or in the case of some, some countries in both sides of the conflict, including the United States, which runs counterterrorism operations with both sides in this conflict. Um, and so we have that complex picture. And yet when we- Dr. Lawrence, yes, could we use a map from time to time? I don't we use a map from time to time. I'd love to. I don't have one handy. So I turn to your staff to maybe put something up. We'll find one. Yeah, um, we'll find but, one. But the uh, um, the 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 current conflict, let's say, took a turn for the worse when with the help of the Russians, primarily General Haftar of the East moved south and then surprisingly moved north just at the time that the UN General Secretary was in Tripoli to prepare a peace conference. He attacked Tripoli, um, which many felt should have been grounds for the UN General Secretary to resign when, 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 when the UN General Secretary didn't respond in a forceful way to the attack. Um, but he did manage to scuttle the peace conference, which was supposed to happen in Libya about two years later. Uh, and then that led to increasing uh, amounts of support for Haftar in his quest to take over the country, and then increasing support for the West to defend itself. Uh, the element in that which was decisive was the increase of new Turkish technology, Turkish drones, Turkish logistics and strategy uh, in the recent months, which turned the tide of the war against the Russians, uh, against other internationals and the Libyan forces from the East and pushed back and allowed the Western government to take control of most of the West. And now we have a major standoff in the center of the country, which Egypt is calling a red line, which if crossed, they said they'll send troops in to deal with. Um, I could go on and on in my introduction, but I'll leave the rest of, of it to our speakers. Uh, I, am, um, I, can, I have to say, um, I have, cannot think of three people better equipped to deal with today's crisis. And I went through dozens of possible speakers. Uh, and the only person who turned us down uh, was a person who just doesn't want to do anything in public these days because she's very well informed and <laughs> doesn't want to get into trouble, I guess. Uh, um, uh, uh, but um, uh, she endorsed all of these three speakers today. And I really appreciate uh, their writings, their speeches, their involvement on Libya for many, many years now. Everyone who works on Libya comes to love Libya uh, and its people. And all of us today are in various ways Libya lovers. Uh, and you're hearing from three of the best um, uh, uh, in, in, the, um, <clears throat> in the discussion today. Let me say also one other thing, because we're going to be starting with a discussion of sort of what's going on with the major players in Libya. We often refer to the West as the GNA, the Government of National Accord that grew out of a UN brokered accord in 2015 between the two sides. And we refer to the Eastern government as the LNA, the Libyan National Army. But the Libyan National Army is not the Libyan National Army. It's actually a group that was originally formed in the 1990s to fight Gaddafi uh, and then was recreated in the 2010s um, uh, uh, to fight the West. Um, uh, by a general that was involved both times, General Haftar, who was one of Gaddafi's generals and then turned against him. And I, we won't go through that whole history. But the UN doesn't refer to the LNA as the LNA. They refer to it as the Libyan Arab Armed Forces, and there are a lot of Arab mercenaries with it, or Haftar's Armed Forces. So you'll hear LNA, but it's actually not the accurate designation, I would say. Now it's, it's HAF or LAAF or LNA to refer to the Eastern Forces, and then GNA to refer to the Western political and military forces. Um, I am not going to introduce our three highly esteemed speakers, uh, speakers with the uh, wonderful type of introduction that Duke did for me. Our, their bios have been uh, resent to you moments ago, uh, but let me tell you uh, why we chose them. Uh, Jalal Harshawi is one of the best informed watchers in the world 
on the, the geopolitics of Libya, understands uh, the French in particular and European positions best better than just about anybody. Uh, and he is rigorously focused on the truth, unlike a lot of people that report on Libya for us who are partisan or ill-informed. Uh, and that 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 privileging of the truth, even if it maybe goes against preconceived notions, which is a model I try to live up to too, uh, informs his approach to Libya, and you'll you'll see exactly what I'm talking about in a few moments. Uh, Virginie Colombier is one of the uh, few scholars of Libya who understands the granularity of what's going on the ground there. Uh, she has an immense uh, and, and, and wonderful network there. She can get into the society and culture and, 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 and history and many other aspects in ways that few others can, including Libyans, which I was joking with her about this morning. Libya is not blessed with good Libya analysts, Libyan analysts of Libya in many cases, although she begs to differ <laughs> with me on that. But a lot of them also are English speaking. Um, and so you'll see with Virginie, uh, and attention to important details that everyone else misses. And Jonathan Weiner is probably the best um, positioned US, former US official to talk about our topic today. He was directly involved in many peace initiatives for Libya as the US envoy. He knows all of the players. He's met with them, including uh, uh, Siraj and Heftar, uh, and can speak to that. Uh, and I'm going to have him first because, uh, sorry, go last because he's going to help us uh, think about pointing the way forward on Libya uh, once we uh, have spent some time understanding where we are in Libya and how we got here. So with that, um, the format today is we're going to be allowing the um, uh, speakers to make about 10 minutes of presentations in answer to questions. Uh, and the first question is going to go to Jalal. And the question for Jalal is, um, uh, what's going on right now, and wh what is the LNA doing right and wrong in your estimation, and what is the GNA doing right and wrong in your estimation? And I turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, thank you, Nkusar, uh, for this uh, privilege and honor. And of course, and I cannot accept uh, such a generous introduction. Um, but I'll try to answer the question. Um, before I get to today, very, very quickly, I'd like to say that most commentary on Libya this year, 2020, has been obviously uh, depicting a, some kind of a crescendo. But most of that crescendo has been attributed to, to Turkey. And that is uh, technically correct when it comes to 2020. But right before 2020, there was another year, 2019, and uh, more specifically, there was a very important step to the second civil war that you, Bill, uh, rightly described, that one particular phase began when this very dramatic decision uh, to launch a, uh, an offensive, and that decision was made by uh, General Haftar, Khalifa Haftar as a person, not his foreign backers, really. Uh, he decided on April 4th that he was going to march um, into the capital, an urban area of 1.2 million people. So it's, it was uh, a very ambitious um, uh, endeavor, and uh, it was immediately supported by uh, the UAE in the form, if, I, if you look at just the year of 2019, from April to December, there were uh, 1,000 airstrikes, the majority of which were conducted using uh, on drones in the urban area of Tripoli in support of, of Haftar. In most you know, in most uh, terminologies or vocabularies, you would call that a military intervention. Uh, but when it comes to this specific case, for whatever reason, um, the it's rarely, rarely described at all. And when it's described, it's not called a military intervention. Two months later, uh, Turkey followed suit by introducing its own armed drones and conducted during the same period from April, from early June to December, roughly uh, 300 uh, airstrikes, so basically a third or less. And th there's another important step. In September, a decision was made to allow uh, Russian mercenaries who had been present in the eastern part of Libya to go uh, into the outskirts of Tripoli and, and participate in, in, in the fighting. So the, this, this decision is also an important uh, uh, step and so you could see that the crescendo is not entirely attributable to uh, to Turkey, uh, although of course uh, this is not a defense of Turkey. Turkey was was uh, was 
obviously interfering in 2019, even before that, uh, to a much smaller extent. And uh, in November, late November 2019, it announced in a very overt, brazen, uh, transparent way that it was going to intervene. So this was a first, because all other forms of intervention were had been clandestine, and Turkey decided to basically move into the overt space. Uh, and this is exactly what, what Turkey implemented actually quite well, if you look at just the technical aspect of it, during the first half of 2020. And, uh, and, and I would like to just uh, basically focus on a moment that is, I think uh, could teach us a lot uh, to answer, to basically answer the question, which, which is what, where do we stand now? Uh, at the moment of, uh, is before the collapse, there was a collapse of the offensive uh, that was basically achieved by sheer force. And of course, Turkey played a crucial role backing the GNA uh, in, in, in making sure that the, the attack that had begun in April 2019 actually was, was ended uh, in early June of this year. But there was a very key moment in mid-May when Moscow and Ankara uh, got into a series of conversations about what to do. And this translated into a mini moment of entente between Turkey and Russia. And how do I and how do you how does it translate into reality? Where starting uh, on May 21st, the Turkish drones basically stopped uh, conducting airstrikes. And the next day, in broad daylight, you had thousands of Russian mercenaries uh, withdrawing from the front line located in the south of Tripoli and basically getting out of uh, most of uh, Tripolitania. Tripolitania is the northwest, the most populous quadrant uh, of, of Libya. So this moment teaches us a lot. It, first of all, it tells us that Turkey and Russia do speak, which is not the case uh, for a lot of the, 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 the enemies or the supposed enemies that you have now between, let's say, the UAE and Turkey, between France and Turkey. You don't really have a genuine conversation. Turkey and Russia are not friends, but they're not uh, enemies in that uh, uh, blunt uh, sense, in the sense that they are act actually able to orchestrate moments of, of coordination that do not typically do not last very long, but they do exist. The second thing that it, this tells us is that Russia never approved of the offensive, of this idea that uh, General Marshall, uh, that, uh, General Haftar was ready uh, to conduct such a, a big uh, project, big military project. Uh, Egypt and Russia are two foreign backers of Haftar that never liked the idea of, of pursuing the offensive. Uh, and the, the third thing that it tells us is that uh, Russia and the UAE are, do not really form an axis. They are on the same side uh, of uh, multiple conflicts, including the Libyan one, but, uh, but Russia was able to basically uh, basically stabbed Haftar in the back uh, by withdrawing the mercenaries. And that basically created a, a two-week period during which only the Libyans and their Sudanese uh, mercenaries in the Tripoli area were pursuing the war with much greater difficulty. And in the meantime, Russia was already preparing the next phase. And the next phase is where we're in the middle of right now, which is basically Russia focusing on a, on a completely different function, which is a defensive function, not, not pursuing some kind of fancy offensive that is completely unrealistic. And uh, this uh, physically translated into the mercenaries of, of Wagner, this uh, semi-state, uh, semi-commercial business uh, called Wagner. Um, and, and those people, uh, the Russian mercenaries, augmented and supplemented with Syrian mercenaries. You have, uh, you know, probably 1,000 or 1,500 uh, Syrian mercenaries on the side of Haftar, not just the 6,000 or 7,000 on the side of the GNA brought in by Turkey. And they concentrated into two uh, locations at the beginning, the Jufra Air Base, which is located in the center of the country, and uh, the CERT. And uh, we're happy, we are lucky to have Virginie here, who's a great expert of of a few uh, municipalities, including this um, uh, very fascinating uh, city called Sirte on the coast, in the middle, really the middle of, of the Libyan coast. And in the meantime, and that's the reason I said to Bill when we, we were preparing this conversation, that effectively uh, the LNA, if you include the Russian component, and if you include the Sudanese component, and if you include the Syrian component, and of course the Libyan component, that entity, that weird creature, with continued help from the Emiratis, crucial help, from the Emirates, uh, they've done uh, a pretty good job from their own perspective. 
they were able to beef up the defense and the deterrence uh, in, in the city of Sirte using snipers, but not, not only that, but also thousands of anti-personnel mines that do act as a very effective deterrent. Uh, greater presence in the form of also air, uh, aircraft, uh, warplanes in Jufra, and uh, now more and more presence in the southwest, where there's also a lot of oil. Um, uh, the Fuzan, I'm talking about Obari, uh, Sharara, all those very key uh, oil-related assets in the southwestern part of, of Libya. So this is where we stand, and that's why I think the, the, the theme, this phrase that was used by uh, the foreign ministry, uh, foreign minister of, of Germany yesterday, deceptive calm is very apt. This is where we stand. Everything has slowed down. The first half of 2020, 2020 was very active, very kinetic, very dynamic, very exciting. And now everything you know, kind of slowed down, which indeed I agree with the Germans is, is deceptive because a lot of it is nasty. And the GNA and Turkey uh, are not in the euphoric, euphoric moment that they were in in early June when, when the, the collapse of the offensive of Haftar happened. Now they could actually take Sirte, or they could take Jofra, they could take the southwest of Libya. But one thing is certain, is that it would be a very difficult battle that will kill hundreds and hundreds of Libyans. So that would be my, my answer to you, Bill. Um, thank you so much, Jalal, for that uh, wonderful uh, uh, comment, which both gave us key elements of big picture and key elements of detail um, all of which we'll be drilling down on uh, uh, as we go forward. Um, we're, we, we've almost used up your 10 minutes, but let me ask your introductory 10 minutes, but let me just ask you one more question. You have a keen understanding of the French connection when it comes to Libya. When we think about how Europe views Libya, we mostly hear about migration and illegal migration, how that negatively affects European politics and has a direct impact on Italian politics and everything else. Uh, and in fact, when the European powers originally were getting involved, it was to block migrants. Now, uh, follow-up missions are talking about blocking Turkish arms shipments. Uh, but um, uh, uh, well, while we're talking about getting beyond the proxy war, uh, uh, to give us a snapshot of how Europe views Libya, uh, maybe what they get right and what they get wrong, uh, and even maybe if you have any thoughts on, on how they can be... Uh, um, part of the solution, obviously, the Germans have had the lead on peacemaking since last January, but uh, any other thoughts on Europe and Libya? Well, I, I, I would always uh, tend to say that Europe is not a thing in geopolitics. Unfortunately, yeah. uh, the, the, the entities that matter at the end of the day are nation states, yeah. especially when you look at the behavior of, of say, France that keeps uh, invoking the EU, but really thinks as as a state, as a single state. Um, each each one is uh, has a very different perception. Uh, I would say that France is not affected by migration. It was never hit by a terror terror related event uh, stemming or emanating from uh, from Libya, and uh, for the all all kinds of historical reasons, uh, France feels that the coast that is geographically closer to it is actually very far away. I'm talking about the Libyan coast. When Tripoli burns, you don't sense a lot of alarm here in Paris. If there's a, the slightest incident in the Fazan or, or the southern uh, southern part of Sudan uh, of Fazan, uh, in the, the uh, near the border with Niger and Chad, of course you would have alarm here exactly. among French decision makers. So what I'm saying is that the perception of Libya uh, here in, in Paris is very similar, not to say identical, to its very, very close ally, the UAE. And, uh, and it plays a diplomatic role. It doesn't play a, a military role. It knows that the UAE is doing a lot of it. Uh, another part is, is actually being done by, by Russia. Russia and the UAE are very, very close when it comes to logistics to uh, military means in, in Libya. So uh, France basically uh, complements this trio by fulfilling a uh, diplomatic, political, and ideological role. And uh, it doesn't really care about the physical level of security uh, in the northwest of, of Libya, for example. Uh, right now, it's happy to show a very uh, assertive, not to say provocative, attitude uh, when it comes to facing off against uh, Turkey. Turkey is abusive on, in many regards, but, but responding the way France is, is doing is not necessarily the best thing. And Germany disagrees, Italy disagrees, and Britain disagrees. So that, I think, uh, will give you an idea of how divided uh, Europe is these days. 
Thank you so much, Jalal. That was uh, extremely interesting. And I'm uh, very also uh, looking forward to your further comments over the course of our hour and a half. Uh, Virginie, we're going to turn to you now. Uh, and I'll ask you a two-part question. First of all, if there's anything you would like to modify or challenge about what I said or, or Jalal said, uh, uh, you could start with that. And then, and then your question is, um, uh, how did the situation on the ground uh, uh, develop from your perspective? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'm very honored to be part of this discussion today. Uh, I would modify maybe your introduction uh, in the sense that I think much of what I learned about Libya and local dynamics, I've taken it from uh, Libyan colleagues and Libyan analysts that have the capacity and know also very well, uh, have a good and very good understanding of what's happening in their own communities. So, and it's precisely the case uh, with regards to SIT. Uh, with the, whom I have a special relationship because of a number of colleagues that are based in this area and that have contributed a lot to the limited knowledge I have of the region. Uh, from um, to, to comment uh, maybe or to build upon what Jalal just mentioned, I think uh, how the situation has developed on the ground. Uh, what has been very clear over the past couple of months is that uh, both increased Turkish support to the GNA and the withdrawal of uh, Russian mercenaries uh, in southern Tripoli in June have really been a game changer. Uh, this has uh, forced, or at least uh, the LNA affiliated forces had to withdraw to this central air base of Jufra, and they also uh, have seen the uh, consolidation reinforcement of the Russian uh, presence uh, in this area. Because the LNA forces had already taken control of the city, the coastal city of Sirte in January, this meant that the front lines had completely uh, moved uh, to central Libya. Uh, so they moved from southern Tripoli to this area uh, organized around the central towns of Sirte and El Jufra. Um, as uh, already uh, mentioned by Jalal, uh, the past few uh, months have uh, been demonstration that there is a real threat of escalation and that military confrontation uh, could go one step further uh, because of the military buildup on both camps, the increased uh, also uh, consolidation and buildup of uh, Russian presence around the two cities, and also uh, the threat uh, more recently of uh, the Egyptians to intervene in the case uh, that Turkey and the GNA forces would attempt to retake control over the city of Sirte that was uh, under the control uh, until December last year. So it was very clear that there was a risk of, of confrontation. Uh, I think more recently what has been uh, very critical um, in addition to the kind of stalemate that we have seen over the past weeks, build up but also kind of uh, position of standoff and um, lack of clarity on the intentions and the objectives of the various actors, uh, the Russian missionaries have clearly consolidated their presence. And over the past two weeks, they've been digging trenches around Sirt, uh, making sand barriers, trying to uh, protect better the link, uh, the road linking Sirt to the airbase of El Jufra. Uh, so this has been important and might indicate uh, some future developments on the ground. From what uh, is uh, being seen on the ground, I think one important aspect here is to maybe have a look at the relationship between the LNA forces and the Russian mercenaries. And from what is taking place in, in Sirte, at least, it seems quite obvious that the LNA command uh, has absolutely no control whatsoever on the Russian forces. And this is something that is very important because, as Jalal mentioned in January, one of the reasons why uh, Moscow and Ankara could not really manage to uh, reach uh, an agreement between uh, the two camps was that they probably lacked uh, influence over the LNA camp. And I think over the past month, one of the key elements that we can uh, highlight is clearly that Russia has managed to uh, significantly increase its influence over the LNA compared to what was the case in January. Over the past few days, I mean, the situation has been evolving slightly uh, in the, the sense that uh, some brigades that had been brought by the Haftar camps in, in Syria has been, with, have been withdrawing. 
which might indicate also uh, that uh, the fate of the city uh, is clearly something which is currently being discussed. And it's discussed not only obviously between uh, Libyan, Libyan actors. Uh, another um, important element, and this has been highlighted yesterday, is that the uh, GNA camp is also uh, consolidating to some extent in terms of international support. You could see, for instance, the dele delegation from Qatar uh, that went to Tripoli yesterday. So you clearly see that uh, the international or the presence of international actors, uh, the international meddling is uh, clearly uh, continuing. Um, I think, despite the fact that the situation seems to be solved for the time being, uh, there are a few elements that uh, can be highlighted. First of all, it has kind of uncertainty about the Russian strategy and the red lines. Uh, as we say, this movement around Sirt uh, indicates that something is going on. It's still not very clear uh, what uh, is in the making. Um, the also internal divisions uh, within both Libyan camps have become increasingly visible over the past weeks. And I think this is something that should certainly has to be insisted upon when we uh, talk about the prospects. And probably Ambassador Weiner will also insist and give more details about the international attempts to negotiate an agreement between the parties. Uh, but I think it's important to go back about uh, the uh, on the on the importance of this region of this e uh, area in which uh, uh, all these Libyan and international forces have been concentrating. Why is it important for the party? What we say? What, why this central region uh, that was not so much uh, talked about before is is important? I think there are many reasons for this. Uh, first, the city of Sirt itself is symbolically important. Historically, it's been the kind of natural border between the eastern region and the western region. And much, much of the uh, conflict and grievances that we have seen re-emerging over the past uh, years, let's say, have uh, something to do with this relationship and tension and uh, previous conflicts between the two regions. Sirt is also the birthplace and the stronghold of Qaddafi and the Qaddafi tribe, which was the most uh, influential uh, during the Qaddafi regime. And for this reason, it has also a deep uh, symbolic meaning uh, for Libyans. Uh, we should also not forget that Sirt has been the, was the capital of the Islamic State uh, uh, during uh, between 2015 and 2016 before it was dislodged after six months of heavy fighting led by uh, brigades from essentially uh, the city of Misrata. Militarily, uh, the city and the region is also very important. Uh, from there, you can control basically all the main coastal roads towards the east, the west and the south. It's in immediate proximity to uh, some of Libya's major oil fields, especially the third basin which accounts for something like 60% of uh, production in the, in, the current, um, in the recent period. And also the city is specific in the sense that the social structures and in the tribal diversity and with the, the links between all the city's major tribes with other areas and other uh, cities in, in the country. So all these issues make the region uh, very, very important strategically. Uh, in addition to this, you also have important military and security infrastructure. Uh, Jalal mentioned the airbase in Al Jufra. There's also an important airbase in, uh, in, in Sirt. Uh, so this uh, makes the city and, the, and control of the city extremely important for both camps. In the recent period, and because of the blockade, the oil blockade that uh, started in January, and the, the uh, leadership, uh, even though it's not presented this way, of uh, Haftar's uh, forces, uh, now the military confrontation has become much more directly linked to the issue of control of oil installations and oil revenues. Uh, clearly, the conflict now is uh, also to a large extent driven by uh, this desire to control oil revenues. Um, the region is clearly at the very heart of the, of the country's economy. And this is why in the recent uh, diplomatic attempts uh, to uh, find an agreement uh, between the bodies, discussions have been ongoing around two main issues. I mean, agreement on sharing oil revenues on the one hand, and also trying to create or think of a kind of buffer zone or de demilitarized area in the Sirt-Jufra uh, area. 
I think here this is something we can discuss and we'll probably discuss. One of the main issues is that after years of conflict, and especially uh, since April 2019, there's a clear problem in terms of who can provide guarantees. And here we go back to what Jalal was saying in terms of the capacity of Moscow and Ankara uh, to maybe provide some form of guarantees that other international actors, including the UN, have been uh, incapable so far of providing. So lack of trust and lack of guarantees are key issues. And I will probably uh, close uh, with a one minute uh, conclusion here. Uh, the impact of this confrontation uh, in the area. I think what we see at the military level, uh, increasingly uh, these uh, concerns, especially on the LNA side, that the Russian withdrawal could really threaten Haftar's coalition. And you see increasingly that LNA fighters clearly lack motivation and that in case of a withdrawal, they might just disband, which is quite worrying, uh, especially after many years of violent conflict. You also see increasingly frequent clashes between LNA-affiliated brigades in Sirt, and clearly the lack of control on the part of the LNA command. So this is worrying at the security level. At the political social level, uh, there is also the way of the city of Sirt in particular has been ruled since January 2020 by the general command has uh, to some extent and to a large extent intensified uh, the competitions and divisions between the major tribes and we increasingly see uh, acts of revenge and uh, increasing uh, tensions at the security level. This adds up, of course, to a very badly uh, deteriorating socio-economic situation. So again, here, I think if we look at the situation on the ground and the most recent development, uh, this leads us to probably an analysis which is quite gloomy. And I would share some of Jalal's um, analysis prospects in terms of where are we heading uh, to. Thank you. Um, because you knew the questions, you've almost answered all of them. Um, but let me, uh, let me just um, note that I left out of my introduction um, that Libya has the largest proven oil reserves in Africa uh, prior to the conflict, uh, oil and gas uh, uh, amounted uh, or account for 97% of Libya's exports. And because of its oil wealth and small population, Libya is one of the seven richest countries in Africa. In some respects, it's the richest and uh, uh, has uh, lots of universities, high education level, high literacy, uh, a lot of uh, factors that distinguish it from other countries on the African continent. Um, uh, I, I, I have lots more questions for Virginie, but in the interest of moving forward, I'm going to move on to Jonathan next. Um, uh, Jonathan, um, what gets us beyond the proxy war? And in particular, what would it take for Turkey and Russia to behave in a way that gets us to a solution to the Libya conflict? Well, there's a difference between zones of influence and partition. There's a difference between zones of influence and fighting a kinetic war over territory. So what we have seen in 2020 is the consolidation of zones of influence, with Turkey having tremendous influence in Tripolitania and with the government of national accord, and Russia becoming the prime actor, really, rather than the UAE or Egypt in the fate of General Haftar's army. And one must remember that this year began with commitments by these and all other countries to stop the conflict in Libya to have a ceasefire, to broker an accord, and meetings between Erdogan and Putin, in which that was all supposed to be announced. And Haftar refused to cooperate, simply left town while Vladimir Putin was still organizing the summit in which there was supposed to be a victory announced ahead of the Berlin conference. So what we have seen is Russia beginning to develop a relationship with the Speaker of the House of the Parliament in the East, Aguila Sala, and various types of talks between Aguila Sala and the G and representatives of the GNA. And in effect, Russia and Turkey 
shutting down the kinetic war, participating in a period of time where intentions are uncertain, where the possibility of a demilitarized cert has been floated and certainly is um, being um, prepared for um, during this period as people try to figure out where things can head um, from here. Hefter is clearly an unacceptable uh, figure of reconciliation and of peace after his efforts, repeated efforts at coups and of his infliction of all of that pain and misery on the West. Haftar told me back in 2016 he intended to take the entire country by force, was going to do it in December 2016. We said no red light, not yellow light, red light, organized everybody uh, to tell him red light. Everyone said red light except Russia. Now, if you look at the sources of support for Haftar, Haftar's patronage network has been built in no small part on the counterfeit dinars provided by the Russian state since the spring of 2016, in the very first months of the GNA after the Skorod Accord. So Russia, uh, the Kremlin, had a diplomatic national security initiative with Haftar and the East to get them going to say, you don't have to deal, we're gonna just keep supporting you. And that allowed for uh, the ability to, for Haftar to build up his forces in his effort to ultimately take uh, the entire country by conquest and by a stampede. When that stampede didn't happen and when the conquest was impaired and then turned around by Turkey, that was the end of that phase. So when, um, Jalal says Russia didn't support the taking of Tripoli. That may have been more kinetic, more aggressive, more quick than Russia really wanted. Um, Russia is looking for a favorable environment in which it has influence in a second uh, Mediterranean country, warm water port for the long term. And it's had the ability to play given the United States withdrawal of imperial influence. And I think we should spend a moment on withdrawal of imperial influence. If you look at the Middle East, one way of thinking about it is that the UK has been withdrawing influence for a very long time in various stages. And the UK's last with two withdrawals have been Cameron's decision to re re substantially reduce foreign affairs spending, reduce the UK footprint and involvement. And then um, Brexit, which consolidated that reduction of presence at the same time that Barack Obama was saying that the world is curving towards progress slowly and we're going to operate with allies and not be too aggressive. And with the United States and Libya, uh, while the United States supported NATO intervention after France and the UK led, um, after the murder of our ambassador, there was a period of time where the US pulled back some and this civil war began to break out. 2014, 15, 16, the US pushed forward a lot again in a multilateral way. And that was the period of time of my work. We helped secure the Skorot Agreement by trying to get everybody aligned. No zones of influence, nobody picking uh, their, their uh, clients, patrons telling their clients, you have to deal, you have to compromise. The outcome has to be good for the whole country have support to, for every region, benefit wide group of constituencies. And that was US policy. Under the current administration, the US essentially attenuated that role. And there was a further opportunity for Russia to play the part of driving things. And so it uh, pushed the power of Haftar and the power of forces from the East further than they otherwise could have gone, gave further um, weight to the efforts of the UAE to avoid a Muslim Brotherhood government, Muslim Brotherhood presence, because there wasn't going to be a Muslim Brotherhood government. Further support to Egypt to go that direction and have to push the envelope with that support. But already by January, you saw Turkey and Russia trying to pull it back after the stampede didn't happen. And so since then, we've seen this zone of influence created by Turkey and Russia, rather than a zone for military conflict, as Jalal elegantly laid out, and as Virginia elegantly laid out for CERT, you now have all of these competing interests playing out simultaneously 
in which it's not clear what direction it's going to take. But I have an idea about that. It may not be the right idea, but at least it's an idea. And the idea is, is that since all of Libya's wealth more or less comes from oil, and the oil has been dramatically disrupted by the Haftar-induced shutdown, creating economic pain in the West. And we've seen electrical outputs in the East, which the National Oil Co uh, Company says that's due to the financial situation we're in, in part can't get things going. And you've seen the Eastern banks essentially insolvent due to forced loans being made for Haftar and for governance in the East. And you've even got risk potentially to the payments that go to every Libyan who fought against Gaddafi and lots who said they did, but didn't as a form of remittances to keep the whole country going. All of that begins to get threatened as this impasse continues. So my argument and my idea is that Libyan, the Libyan discussions within the UN framework to begin to free up resources by first getting them turned back on and then getting them shared in three ways uh, could provide a basis for moving beyond this uh, for the Libyans and that the Libyans can drive an alternative to zones of influence if Libyans don't want to wind up with zones of influence. Now we know Haftar needs Russia, needs the Emirates, and needs Egypt, but everybody in the East may not want it in the same way if they can get economic benefits. We know that the GNA military needs Turkey to stop the Russians, to stop the Emiratis, to stop the Egyptians, to stop that more than a thousand drone attacks. But it may not need them or want them at the same level if there are economic deals to be had that unites the country. So uh, the money should be going, I believe, into the pockets of every single Libyan. In the same way in the United States, every Alaskan gets a small or large amount of money depending on the price of oil. Um, and how much is left over after fundamental governmental uh, requirements have been funded. And then you have money going to municipalities, not just Tripoli and Misrata, Sabrata, um, um, uh, CERT, all the way uh, east, um, all the way east to Beta, all the way east to Tobruk, including the southern cities. You do it on a per capita basis. And you have that going to town councils, civilian town councils, not militaries. And that begins to fund um, municipal um, activities and create the ability to have functioning governments at the local level. You, uh, other resources clearly are going to need to be spent at the national level. And there's going to have to be some formula at some point for recapitalizing the banks in the East and getting economic activity going. Now, what's the benefit to Turkey for all of this? Well, Turkey has a tremendously wonderful uh, corporate sector. It's got great construction companies. It's got great infrastructure companies. And it's got the ability to help Libyan reconstruction in a world where Libyan oil revenues are re restored. What does Egypt have? Egypt has superb workers at a variety of different levels and sectors who were working in Libya before, including Egyptian cops who were working safely in Libya before. And the economic benefits to Egypt of a functioning Libyan East, an economically functioning Libya East, that is sustainable, is potentially huge. As long as they know that they're not going to be subject to terrorist attacks across their border, that they don't have to worry about Muslim Brotherhood funding of Muslim Brotherhood parties in Egypt coming out of Libya. The Emiratis, similarly, I believe their core concern is Libya money being put to the wrong purposes, that is to fund political movements in the Gulf, for example, or elsewhere. So there are elements of a formula here that can address Libya's economic issues and create security uh, solutions at the local level that do not require big military forces or anybody to conquer anybody. The way you get there is through fostering dialogue and negotiation and through having big powers say, cut it out to the extent that your weapons have come from the United States and you keep doing this, it's going to have an impact on other bilateral uh, elements of the, your relationship with the United States. Uh, publicizing what Wagner has been doing, 
looking at further sanctions, not only U.S., but EU. Um, these can begin to create uh, countervailing pressures on a big power like Russia. Heart to heart conversations with the Emirates, um, with the Qataris, uh, with the Turks, or with the Egyptians are all things that a incoming administration needs to do just as it appears the Trump administration has done in recent weeks. I urge everyone to read the um, statement by Robert O'Brien, the National Security Advisor. It would be wrong for me to say this is a return to the Obama policy, because that would be the easiest way to kill it. What I would say is, is that it is a return to the policies that the career people at the Department of Defense and the Department of State um, almost certainly have been advocating continuously throughout all of this. It is not in the interest of the United States to see Russia uh, maintain a permanent military presence in Libya, have a military base in Libya. And actually, I wouldn't urge it on the Russians. I think the Libyans um, who kicked the, uh, the, uh, the United States out, looking at it on a Wheeler Air Force Base, which is uh, no longer known as a, a Wheeler Air Force Base, but the TIPA, a number of years ago, um, uh, might have their own points of view on Turkey having a permanent base, or Russia having a permanent base, or any foreign government having a, uh, a, Libya, a permanent base in Libya. They might take an almost proto-neo- Algerian point of view, that Libya is one country and that Libyans should uh, make their own decisions and not be told what to do by a bunch of imperialists, whether they're imperialists from the Gulf, imperialists from the East, imperialists from the North, imperialists from the Americas. That might be a, ultimately a Libyan perspective. So is there a way through? I think there is a way through. It's empowering Libyans to talk with one another and having other countries discourage the patrons from funding and supporting kinetic activity or from permanent zones of influence. Use your influence to push towards national unity. That helps you deal with terrorism. That helps you deal with the risk of economic collapse. That helps you deal with the risk of coronavirus, which ultimately affects everybody, including all of Europe and beyond. Um, that helps you deal with the, the, the horrors of humanitarian crisis across the board. So there are many good things that come of this kind of a policy if you can get beyond narrow short-term national interests. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And uh, uh, I have to say that you answered all three of the questions, so I won't, I won't repeat them. Uh, we have nine questions that have come in from the outside, and I'd like to get to those very quickly because uh, that's often the most uh, interesting part of a panel like this. Uh, let me ask Jalal and Virginie to hold any comments they have about what Jonathan said to, during the Q&A uh, session and feel free to, to make them at that time. And same for Jonathan on the other two panelists. Uh, let me also just um, say two things uh, since they were referred to. Uh, number one, COVID-19 is spiking this week in ways we have not seen yet in Libya. Libya was to a large degree spared until now. And now we're getting hundreds of cases, and now we're getting uh, uh, dozens of deaths uh, and uh, on a daily basis. And so the cat is finally out of the bag in Libya, and that's going to be affecting things the way we thought it was going to before going forward now in, a, in, a, in, in perhaps a dramatic way, particularly given how the um, uh, many aspects of the healthcare system are in shambles since health facilities, a bit like in Syria, have been targeted. Uh, in this conflict, uh, particularly by forces from the East. Um, let me also say that the um, surprise announcement in November that Jalal referred to uh, the Turkey-Libya agreement grew out of a Libyan visit to the United States earlier in the fall, during which, and I was privy to some of these conversations, I was there in the room, uh, 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 Libyans were told, you aren't going to get the kind of support you need from the United States to defend yourself go to Turkey. And so there was direct advice to Libyans during their visit to the United States that they would be more likely to get this sort of robust uh, uh, um, assistance to defend themselves that they would not get from the United States against the Russians uh, from Turkey. And that was uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, this, this agreement happened in November, as Jalal rightly pointed out, as a key moment. Um, the um, first question to Jonathan Weiner, 
on the civil war, will the GNA forces uh, collapse under the pressure of Haftar's air campaign of foreign help, leading to an even uglier block by block ground war in Tripoli's neighborhoods? What impact will the newly arrived Turkish sponsored forces have? Will the Libyans move beyond slaughtering one another to kill foreigners in their midst? Will the proxy war stay limited to Libya or have consequences beyond uh, Libya's borders, north, south, east, and west? Let me just help Jonathan by starting by saying the locus of conflict has moved from Tripoli. It's no longer in Tripoli. It's moved to the center, as we've been uh, indicating in this panel so far. But uh, I turn the floor over to you, Jonathan. I mean, the great question right now is whether Libyans are prepared to slaughter other Libyans further for territory or would prefer to try and negotiate their way out. And in my experience, Libyans are remarkably non bloody minded in practice. Bloody minded in rhetoric any number of times as people all over the world can be. But in practice, there is not a taste for Libyans to kill uh, other Libyans in the way we have seen in some other countries. It's one of the graces uh, that that's true. And uh, I believe that there, everyone is looking for a way out of avoiding additional kinetic activity. Uh, this, uh, the past kinetic activity was driven by General Haftar and by foreign patrons. And um, I think uh, people want their, their areas of safety. And certainly there are warlords who are going to fiercely defend their neighborhoods. And Libyans will take out threats that they view to be intolerable, such as Islamic State was, um, and other terrorist uh, group control. But I think there is a preference not to slaughter one another. And I would echo that. I would say it's one of the strange conflicts I've ever analyzed or looked at where the combatants really don't want to kill each other and uh, combatant leaders will often have the cell phone and might even be related to on a family basis the person they're fighting on the other side of <laughs> so it's it's a very strange and 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 one of the ways mercenaries have one of the reasons mercenaries have been brought in and mercenaries are such a factor is because mercenaries are willing to kill libyans in a way we hadn't seen before and that's one of the the complicating factors I'm going to go to the third question here and give it to Jalal um, on who controls Libya. Uh, will the Prime Minister Fayez Sarraj survive a fifth year as Libya's recognized leader? Will General Haftar instead emerge from the bloodshed and rubble as Libya's new dictator? Or will some other rough beast in its hour come round at last slouch towards Tripoli to be born? A reference to the poem by A. Yates. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think uh, Virginie uh, answered this uh, partially by, by talking about the lack of enthusiasm uh, on the side of, of Haftar. Uh, there has been a lot of publicity about this big army. In, in reality, there has been a chronic reluctance to uh, go to the front line. And that, is, uh, that, is the, that, is, that explains why there has been such big use of, uh, of mercenaries on the side of of Haftar. So when it comes to conducting a war uh, uh, that consists in grabbing territory or, uh, or keeping territory, there's, uh, there's a reality that is uh, much more lukewarm and fragile than the, the typical perception that we have of it. So the, the control, the strict control is, uh, is really concentrated in the, in the key cities of uh, northern Cyrenaica. And even even between Tobruk, let's say, and and Benghazi, there's a difference in terms of who call, calls the shot. So there are a lot of players whose name is not famous that uh, be credited when it comes to uh, to really controlling the the territory. I'm not even talking about the south. And when you go to uh, the situation on the GNA side. Uh, post June 5th. June 5th is the moment when the LNA's, uh, the, the Haftar offensive actually was uh, put an end to. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of maps circulating in the social media, and I think they are over optimistic when it comes to the actual uh, surface or, or the area that is controlled by the GNA. Um, yeah, as you know, Bani Walid, uh, for example, is not really, uh, except a few patrols. Uh, sometimes you have like, uh, uh, military vehicles from the GNA that come come through, but other than that, there's no real control. Um, and I would say that the the territorial control of the GNA is concentrated in the west. And again, same thing. If you take a zoom and look into the difference between, let's say, Tripoli and uh, Zawiya. Zawiya is a city, a coastal city of 250,000 
uh, located just uh, you know 45 kilometers to the west of Tripoli, there's already disagreements. There are already fault lines and and people refusing uh, to really let the GNA uh, control territory. So uh, so the, the picture is a much more complicated puzzle than just uh, Fayyaz and Faraj on the one side and Haftar on the other. And next question is for Virginie. What are your thoughts on political compromise as it relates to national dialogue? Could you expand on the role of Libya's unknown intermediary elites, such as tribal leaders and civil society members? Well, um, I think the situation has significantly changed over the past years in this regard, when it comes to the capacity of Libyans to um, discuss and reach uh, agreement. I think clearly it's been one of the main challenges for the UN-led mediation since 2015, uh, who to uh, have at the table, how do you represent and make sure that you have the most, the main components of society that can be represented and accepted as uh, legitimate representatives by, by the society. And this is something that the UN mediation has been uh, struggling with. So this was for several years one of the key issues. How do you make sure that those people that will be brought in to discuss uh, power sharing agreement essentially for many years, how do you make sure that they are the right people and then uh, that any agreement that can be reached uh, can be implemented? And it's been one of the key obstacles that was never really overcome, uh, honestly, if we look at even uh, the, um, let's say, limits of the Libyan political accord uh, signed in December 2015. Um, one of the reasons why uh, UN representative Hassan Salame tried to adopt a different approach was precisely for this. He was uh, continuing to focus on discussions between uh, the most important political and military figures, but at the same time he was convinced that there was a need to find a way to bring in um, a more representative or at least a more significant part of the Libyan society into dialogue, into not only power sharing uh, issues, but also to discuss more fundamental uh, issues that had been uh, conflictual since 2011. And this is why the, the, the failure of the national conference in the sense that it collapsed because of the beginning of uh, Haftar's military operation was so important and such a delusion because this approach was something new, which aimed at trying to bring in more, uh, or at least to, to promote uh, increased Libyan ownership uh, to the discussions. Uh, the situation has obviously become much more complicated now, because as was uh, illustrated uh, throughout the discussion, the conflict now is not essentially or only uh, between Libyan stakeholders and Libyan actors. Uh, the scope and the importance of external meddling make a pure Libyan uh, dialogue process or mediation process much more difficult. Uh, and this is exactly also what uh, Hassan Salame experienced uh, last year. Now, to some extent, there's probably a need, uh, first of all, to have processes that can go parallel to each other. I mean, addressing different actors to make sure that the various levels of conflicts are addressed. But at the same time, there's probably uh, a major issue which is important uh, if we want some of the main root causes of the conflicts to be addressed. You need to have a kind of process that makes sure that there is sequencing of them. Of the, of, of the mediation or of, of the diplomatic process. Obviously, you need priorities. You need things to be achieved in the short run. And probably here, uh, finding an agreement on uh, some financial issues, power sharing, etc. But if we want to make sure that any such agreement is sustainable and is considered a legitimate by the majority of the Libyans, there's also a need to go beyond and think of a long term, longer term process in which some of the key issues that are not really often uh, discussed between Libyans will be discussed between Libyans. And here I would join some of the issues that Ambassador Weiner was discussing. Uh, there are 
deeply political uh, divisive issues that were never addressed by Libyans since 2011. For many years, the focus has been on how do we share power? How do we make sure that the most influential political and military players uh, get a uh, seat in the government or uh, military positions, etc.? But there was no discussion what Libyans uh, think in terms of what the form of the state would be, how local development uh, could be um, thought of, how resources and uh, the richness of the country could be, could be distributed. So all these issues require also a broader discussion that cannot be implemented tomorrow, obviously. And here, this is why I think the sequencing is very important. But I think starting also uh, putting these issues on the table is one of the very few um, ways in which you can provide guarantees to the actors that they think that they are interested in or concerned about, uh, sometimes uh, scared about, uh, will be discussed and to make sure that they can find some kind of reassurances. So again, I think the, the, the way the process is designed is very important. Unfortunately, I think it's, and you're a better place than I do uh, to, to, to know this, that uh, it's not usually what um, foreign diplomacy, I mean, foreign um, uh, embassies or even the UN uh, would privilege because it's much more complicated and require resources that are not necessarily available. Uh, but I think in terms of how to design a successful process, these are issues that should absolutely be, dis be discussed. Thank you so much for that thoughtful comment, Virginie. The next question is for Jonathan. Uh, what does the UN and the international community in general, including the US, equate, or, or why does the UN and the international community the US equate between both sides in the conflict where the situation clearly involves uh, an aggressing side, which does not respect international norms, to say the least, as Mr. Jalal indicated that Haftar st uh, started his offense while the UN General Secretary is in Libya, and a victim in the West that has the right to defend itself. Um, we do. Why do we equate between a rogue Libyan elements with no legitimacy to speak of, Haftar and his militias, inviting rogue elements, Wagner group mercenaries from Sudan, Somalia, and Syria, and a legitimately internationally recognized government, the GNA, which signed a defense agreement uh, with a legitimate NATO member, government to defend itself from aggression. And as a comment, these two issues are reflected in the bill introduced in the U.S. House and Senate of the Libya Stabilization Act, which just went through markup in the House uh, and is now going to go through markup in the Senate. Uh, over to you, um, uh, Mr. Weiner. Um, I don't think anyone should be equating anyone with anyone in Libya. There is an internationally recognized government of national accord. That's the government the United States recognizes. There have been other Libyans, um, you could call them the Haftar forces, who have attacked that government. The United States opposed that attack um, most of the time, at least. Um, there was the one moment between the, the phone call between President Trump and General Haftar, which was facilitated by the Egyptians and the Emiratis, which was remarkably unhelpful. But if you leave that aside, and the period immediately following that is the U.S. foreign policy tried to resurrect uh, the underlying policy rather than the transaction, the United States has been opposing conquest and supporting dialogue for a long time. And for dialogue to work, it has to be inclusive and it has to provide benefits throughout the country. Uh, it has to provide economic, political, and security benefits throughout the country. And to get there, there needs to be one process involving a lot of different actors, a lot of different components. That has to be the UN process. And uh, it needs to have the patrons tell their clients, you all need to deal now. The, you all need to compromise. Because until the patrons do that, it's very hard to imagine it being successful. Now, how do you make that work in practice? Well, it's Virginia. Uh, just suggested, there is a lack of confidence in any number of areas for any number of Libyans. And so finding confidence building measures that are going to work at the local level to solve a variety of different kinds of problems, some of which are political, some of which are security, and some of which are economic, uh, there's going to have to be a, a sequencing there. Uh, you can have some early victories. Um, one victory is agreement on ceasefire for the foreseeable future. Another agreement would be the re removal of mercenaries. 
and seeing mercenaries depart the country visibly. That would be a great confidence building measure. Um, seeing the oil uh, pumped again and sold again and revenues uh, uh, therefore being distributed in some way that begins to, to deal with the economic needs of the entire country might be another set of uh, sequential confidence building measures. Um, if you look at the work that Goss and Salome did, both before the National Assembly was planned, which was going to take place right around the time Haftar uh, undertook his attack in April 2019, and that was not an accident. I think he did it in part to derail that political process. If you look at that and all the mechanisms endorsed at the Berlin Conference in January 2020, there's an awful lot of negotiation and discussion built into those which would provide foundations for all kinds of confidence building measures, including discussions between the respective militaries. So it's a matter of getting them enacted and getting pressure on Libyans not to do this or do that or agree to this or agree to that, but to meet with one another and to start talking these things through. One of my great frustrations when I was special envoy was Libyans would boycott um, efforts at conciliation, at mediation. Not arbitration. We weren't going to ever tell them what to do. Mediation and one side or another side would just boycott, effectively shutting down the process. And we had to get beyond that to get the government of national accord, which was supported by Egypt and supported by Turkey and supported by Russia and China and France and the UK and Tunisia and Algeria and Qatar and the Emirates and Saudi Arabia and Sudan and so on. Everybody was there. Everybody endorsed it. And so there was this moment uh, where the Libyan clients were told by their patrons, time to deal. And that becomes a critical element of securing success. The Libyans need to talk. There need to be sequenced confidence building measures. And the patrons need to be pushing towards it rather than against it. How you get Turkey and Russia to that place, the Emirates, uh, in Egypt, uh, Qatar, France, uh, among others, all to that place is going to take uh, some work. But uh, as Samuel Johnson, the British philologist, famously said, the prospect of a hanging concentrates the mind. And back in 2015, we had the Islamic State having taken over Sirte and the area around Sirte, the Sirte Basin, and slaughtering Egyptian cops, putting them in orange jumpsuits and cutting their heads off, blood on the beach, horrific human rights violations, and milking the territory for revenue and control, and uh, taking over the people and giving them no rights of any kind. Horrific. And the prospect of that, I believe, helped get all the countries to say, Libyans, you need to deal. Well, we've got equally dangerous, can't, shouldn't say equally, but very dangerous threats for Libya ahead, civil war being one, COVID being another, economic and humanitarian crisis being another. These need to be averted. They can be averted by people talking and building inclusive um, discussions that result in confidence building measures that provide a path forward. Which leads us to our next question for Jalal. Uh, what is the likelihood of Egypt sending in troops to back General Haftar what would the regional implications of this action be? Well, yeah, this basically uh, needs to be connected with the relatively, from a technical perspective, a relatively good performance on the part of this duo, uh, Wagner and the UAE. The two are inseparable from a logistical perspective and the, de the defense line that they have been able to implement uh, over the last couple of months has been quite uh, compelling. Uh, what I'm saying is that the reason, and that's a paradox, uh, on the 20th of June, President Sisi uh, was the only one really to announce a red line. Uh, the red line consists of uh, Sirte and Jufra. And the red line, paradoxically, has been uh, defended and enforced by other people, not Egypt. And what I'm saying is that Egypt has a little bit of leeway, it has a little bit of time, and it has every intention to utilize that uh, you know, room for maneuver. That's the reason it's taking its sweet time, but it's active. Uh, 
it's active in the western part of Egypt. If you if you watch the actual activity, you would notice things. So that basically leads me to think that uh, two things. Two things basically. Egypt is deeply interested in uh, fashioning, modeling, reshaping their leadership of the only security architecture that it can depend on in the eastern part of Cyrenaica. So I'm basically distinguishing the eastern part of Cyrenaica and the western part of Cyrenaica. It, it will, I think, go in, eventually, it will step into the eastern part of Cyrenaica to ensure additional an additional buffer of security along its own border. And it will take advantage of that physical presence to go and massage uh, the leadership of the LNA, a, a process that it has already begun doing, really. Uh, if you notice, uh, in the discourse of, uh, of Egypt, uh, Egyptian officials, over the last several weeks, there's no mention of Haftar. And there's not even a mention of Aguila Saleh. Uh, so that you can see that they want a more collegial uh, kind of framework where uh, people are do not become superstars. They don't become whimsical and end up holding as much power as, as Haftar did in 2019. So it's basically a hybrid form of intervention that I kind of expect on the part of, of Egypt. Something will happen, I, I would say, but not a, a direct or frontal clash against the GNA because one of the main reasons is because other people are taking care of it, the Russians and 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 the mercenaries and so on and so forth. So unless it becomes strictly necessary, I think Egypt has no desire to get into that kind of dynamic. I've got three follow on questions for you that I'll save for WhatsApp because I'm moving to the next audience question. Um, uh, this is for uh, Virginie from the uh, Christopher Blanchard at the US uh, Con Congressional Research Service. Uh, reporting suggests that an internationally monitored escrow arrangement for Libyan oil revenues and an internationally monitored de-escalization zone may emerge as components of an agreement. What needs to be in place to make such arrangements work? What local political considerations need to be taken into consideration to make these mechanisms successful? What effect do you expect such arrangements might have on the dynamics inside Libya and among outside actors? Well, it's um, quite... Uh... Challenging question. It's Congress, uh, <laughs> especially in a short, uh, short period of time. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, one of the main issues is something we've already um, briefly discussed: is the issue of of trust, trust building, and, and guarantees beyond even the technical aspects of this. Um, we are in a situation in which after um, one year and five months or something like this of uh, violent conflict, which has added up to already uh, several years of ups and downs and phases of conflict, um, despite the fact that, as you were saying, Libyans are not have no uh, will to uh, slaughter one another, uh, the polarization and the uh, violence that has come to really um, characterize the relationship uh, between the various, not only the main warring camps directly, but also communities across, across the country make, uh, especially if we think of the demilitarized zone, uh, something which is going to be very difficult uh, to implement if there is no uh, solid uh, mechanism that can really uh, make sure that uh, guarantees are, are provided. And on both sides, um, the lack of trust and the idea that uh, there is a risk that the other camp would take advantage of a limited withdrawal to uh, consolidate and uh, try again to, uh, to attack is something which is very, very much present. It was already the case when uh, there were discussions around uh, ceasefire in, in Tripoli, but I think it's become even more the case now. So this is something uh, that has to be uh, absolutely central to the discussions. Uh, what kind of guarantees, and again, not only what kind of guarantees, but who can provide these guarantees. And here again, I think we are in this dilemma uh, when uh, there is kind of a broad um, let's say, agreement on the fact that not so many people want uh, the Russians or the Turks uh, play a key role in this 
sector, I mean, providing guarantees, but the fact is that uh, they have built for themselves a position over the past year in which they actually have an important role to play. And this is something which is becoming uh, quite, uh, quite difficult to deal with. How do you get out of this? And here again, I think the um, policies uh, of uh, the US administration is something which is clearly uh, very crucial uh, because who else uh, have the capacity uh, to counterbalance or play a mitigating role in this regard. So I think here uh, there's a very, very important issue. I'm talking more about the military uh, dimension. On the economy, uh, I think we also have some kind of, um, to some extent, the same issue of, uh, of trust. Uh, as you know, um, the competition for uh, resources and revenues from all is also linked to the fact that both camps think that uh, the riches of Libya have been used or may be used to uh, reinforce militarily, uh, to pay for weapons, to pay for fighters, etc. So here again, uh, this central issue of trust is something that has to be addressed. So the various mechanisms that are being discussed uh, to think of how to supervise, how to monitor, how to make sure that uh, the oil revenues are to some extent neutralized, at least for an interim period during which uh, further talks can be, uh, can be conducted is something which is very important. But I don't think, I mean, I'm not very eager to enter into the very details here because it would be also something that require more technical knowledge, I, I suppose. I've not been following so closely. I think uh, Mr. Weiner probably has more details about, uh, about all this. And I'm going to encourage all of you that did get you, your questions answered, and the questions are still pouring in, certainly I'd be happy to address them privately myself. If any are emailed to me and others in the, who are involved today will, would, would, would be happy to help uh, uh, after this event uh, to, to get you answers to your questions. Which brings me to the last question I'm going to ask, and I'd ask for a relatively brief answer, Jonathan. On Libya's oil, will the conflict force the National Oil Corporation that are curtail production of the country's principal source of revenue? And if so, what are the consequences for ordinary Libyans? Will any of the warring actors grab and divert oil for themselves? It's been an inter international consensus, which has been enforced so far, not to allow for oil diversion. If oil starts getting diverted in substantial mechanisms, that is a uh, recipe for the fracturing of the country. Um, right now, there's almost no oil being pumped uh, from onshore. That is potentially catastrophic. The question becomes, how long does it take uh, for Libya's sovereign wealth to, to run out? And in the meantime, the, the governor of the central bank is clearly um, uh, tightening the spigots of what he's willing to allow spent. So it is a looming catastrophe to shut down the oil. It also impairs the national oil um, company from being able to um, repair, issue contracts and repair lines and get Libyan oil production up, which Libya is going to need for the long term. So again, an early confidence building measure, an early sign that people are really serious about talking would be to see the oil turned on again. It's been turned off um, since January by Haftar to increase the pressure. I would encourage all of our participants today to take out a map uh, when you go back and watch this for a second time. Uh, and certainly um, we'll put a map hopefully right in the middle next time for a talk like this, because it's essential to understand Libya's geography to understand what's going on. Uh, one thing I eliminated from my opening comments was uh, that the, the name of Algeria is Jezair, which means the islands. Um, but sometimes I often think, uh, or it's, I often think that this is a more appropriate name for Libya where you have these islands of population in a huge sea of sand. Uh, uh, and, you, and, and to understand the Libya, you have to understand the geography uh, in order to get at these questions. We've had references to paradoxes, to dilemmas, uh, to the Yeats poem, Slouching Towards Bethlehem, and the, the, the remark of a British philologist. Um, but we uh, uh, hope that despite all of these uh, references that you're better educated today about what's going on in Libya than you were before, and that you continue to uh, look into these uh, complexities of Libya, which are essential for understanding how we get out of the current situation. I don't know, Duke, in our last minute, if you'd like to make any comment. Is he there?
Are you there, Duke? Let me just uh, then bid everyone farewell. We will look forward to following up with you at future events uh, and, and any questions that get past us, we'd be happy to answer. Uh, I have learned a lot today and uh, I, I didn't expect to learn so much and it's been uh, really wonderful to have such a uh, fantastic panel uh, joined together today to deal with some of Libya's most important issues. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you at the next event.